side. Hello? Yeah, real credit to Blue. <laughs> story from a novel I wrote called Through the Windshield about a guy that used to live around here called Anybody Seen Jimmy D? First thing I did was drive back up the hill to pick up my $34 from Thief, the bookie. Big snowflakes were falling in a day without wind. A pack of dogs loped across the road. I parked the cab and went inside. Thief's on his stool with a Dillinger haircut and black suspenders. The place was neat as a pin. Candy, cases of pop, a framed charcoal portrait of his sister's poodle. Snapshots of nieces and nephews on the big mirror behind him, along with souvenir decals from the Grand Canyon and Reno, places like that, sent to him from relatives. <clears throat> Thief himself never left town. I said good morning to him and sat down at the table while he figured what I had coming. Jimmy D was at the table, going over the out-of-town racetrack entries paper. How you doing, Jimmy? Not bad, Junior. He speaks in a low whisper from the tomb. A little bow-legged guy, looks like an old jockey, wrapped in scarves and sweatshirts and sweaters, his coat over the back of the chair. Seventy-five years old, maybe eighty, maybe ninety. Let me put it this way. Jimmy started out as a gambler, betting fifteen-cent baseball parlays on Bolivar Road. His face, when he takes off his shades, is like a small, full moon seen through a passing cloud. He has the wide, glazed look of a man who's been watching baseball bets go out the window since the days of Ty Cobb. Of a man who thought he'd seen every possible way a horse race can be lost. He takes a kind of quiet, bitter pride in having survived years of defeats that would have killed a more sensible man. <laughs> his eyes look as though he's watching himself in disbelief. He didn't live on the south side anymore, but he'd been betting with Thief for 30 years at least, and he never missed a day there. Twelve noon, he'd be at the table, squinting over the entries and scrawling out slips. Maddening combination bets no one but Thief could make sense of anymore. Round robins, two-four reverses. Jimmy D and Thief, head to head for 30 years. Thief had been winning for 30 years. They didn't speak to one another. You betting any horses today, Jimmy? I bet the double at Aqueduct. I bet the numbers seven and four. He said this with the calm assurance of a man to whom winning is a very minor threat. You mean you're just picking numbers? <clears throat> I do everything. I've done everything. The last time I hit a double was in 1982. <laughs> 1780 it paid. I noticed a big gold ring that said TRW. You used to work at TRW? He looked down at the ring as though noticing it for the first time himself. Thirty years I worked there. Really? Which one? First at 65th and Clark, and then they transferred me to the plant in Euclid, Ohio. <clears throat> yeah, Euclid Avenue. I used to live out there. My folks live out there. You know where the Beverly Hills Cafe is? That place still open? Yeah. Drank a lot of whiskey in that joint. I could barely hear him now. I was leaning over the table. Fifth of whiskey a day I was drinking in that joint. Keith said, here you are, M.D. I went up and got my money. Took it back to the table and counted it. Thirty-four forty. wonder if Mary's still tin and bar out there, Jimmy was saying. A lot of women out there. <laughs> Jimmy was getting smaller by the minute. <laughs> The door opened and a lean old hillbilly came in, stomping snow off his shoes. He sat at the table next to Jimmy and started writing out what looked like a horse bet. He looked like he'd lived a hard 40 or 45 years, in the dark, without saying much. He was wearing a red baseball cap, really a sad, luckless-looking guy. Yep, Jimmy said, a lot of women out there. <laughs> he took one look at the guy in the cap and confided in me. 
I better not talk about women around this guy. It's a dead issue with him. <laughs> a dead issue. <laughs> I laughed and told him I'd see him around. I bought a pack of cigarettes from Thief and went out back out to the cab. <laughs> Early spring. Gradually, steadily, the days began to warm up or to lighten up as if there were more air to breathe and a certain elu elusive buoyancy on the way. We had a few good sunsets, burning low and lingering behind the bridges, and I began to feel we were in the clear. And then one night it all went away and was gone, and I found myself the next morning shivering in the raw, pure atmosphere of another winter morning laid bare to outer space like the lid had been ripped off in the night and all warmth escaped upward and out, scraping ice off the windshield while the car idled, warming up, sputtering, smelling the blue, pure breath of gasoline in the car's labored exhaust. Should we cry for you? Li what? Should we cry for you? <laughs> <laughs> cry for the car. I don't think... All right, yeah, all right, thank all right, you. All right, all right. <laughs> Later that morning, clouds began to roll in, and that afternoon we got hit with a motherfucker of a snowstorm, but there was none of the nervous communal excitement that builds and pulls closer around the coming of a big storm. By now, it was just a pain in the ass and a weight on the heart. That night, I sat at the kitchen table with the lights off and sipped whiskey and coffee and smoked a few cigarettes, watching the big flakes falling between my house and Ed's. The snow kept falling all night, and the winds picked up and whistled for a while, and then died away around three in the morning. I went out for a walk through the enclosed and muffled neighborhood, came back, and went to bed with the snow still falling. Bye. I woke up around eight, same story, with the winds back, raving and whistling, choked with falling snow and the snow they swept off the ground into deep drifts up against the walls and fences and between cars and in the middle of where the street had been. Day like that, I was going to clear a hundred easy in the cab. <clears throat> I coasted down to the garage. The driver's room was buzzing, and Wooster was busy on the phone, calling drivers at home, asking if they could work. He pulled my time card and said he'd be sending us out around 10. I went out to my car and churned back up the hill home, fried a couple eggs with hot pepper, and drank my coffee with a shot of bourbon in it. Before going back down, I stopped to see Ed. He was at the table, listening to the news on a transistor radio, waiting for basketball results. The city was at a standstill. I blew into Thief's with a gust of snow. Thief lived upstairs, so it was no problem for him to get to work. But there, at the table, in the calm, from this, away from the storm, sits Jimmy D, lost in coats and squinting over the out-of-town entries. I sat at the table and said, How's it going, Jimmy? Hello, Junior. He was holding the paper about three inches from his face. I said, Jimmy, maybe you should get some glasses. Why is that, he said, blowing the paper. <coughs> Didn't you see the weather? It's rough out there. Don't you ever miss a day with Thief? He looks at me with those big round eyes and that ball of tobacco in his cheek and says, calmly, In January of 1937, Cleveland got hit with the worst blizzard in its history. Downtown was out of commission. All public transportation was down. The roads were closed. There were 14 fatalities. <laughs> the National Guard was called in. The river froze. People went out of the house and didn't turn up until spring. <laughs> I was here. <laughs> then he goes back to the entrance. I smiled and got a pack of luckies from Fief. Before I left, I said, Hey, Jimmy, how'd you do that day in 37? I hit the double at the fairgrounds, he said. <laughs> 1260 it paid. Me and Ed are leaning on the fence, assessing the morning, taking stock, weighing the possibilities, listing the pros and cons, drawing up an agenda, when Jimmy D comes by, comes by, on his way to Phoebe's. Hey, Jimmy. How's it going there, kid? He whispers. How you doing? He stops. He says, I haven't hit a baseball bet in 63 days. Yesterday was 63 days. Today will be 64. Jesus, what about the horses? He hands me a slip of paper listing yesterday's horse bets. Horses underlined or scribbled out, full of loops and arrows and arcane codes. I can't make head or tail of it. What's this 37 minus 12? I bet $37 on horses yesterday, and I won back 12. 
<laughs> yeah. Well, with any luck today, you'll lose it all. <laughs> Still, I don't see how you can lose 63 consecutive baseball bets. It's them fucking three-teamers. I'm betting $5 three-teamers. Two games come in, I lose the third. It's not my fault. Why not bet two-teamers? I can't afford it. <laughs> I go to Thieves to bet the Monday night game. Jimmy D's at the table. Jimmy, he ain't seen me in a while. He turns to look up at me, eyes wide. I could be anyone. A tout, a telegram, a birthday cake, his father, the law, Eddie R. Carroll, St. Peter, Walter Johnson, Kid Gavilan, Mr. Death. Finally, my face clicks for him. How are you, he asks. I'm good. He's searching for a meaning to this encounter. You working, he asks as though this is a question he remembers people ask. Yeah, I'm working. You seen your old man? Yeah, I'm going out there to see him now. I'm going to eat lunch with him. How's Big Eddie? He's, you know, he's staying above water. Yeah, the water's pretty deep, especially when you hit that ocean. <clears throat> hey. So that's enough about Jimmy D. Oh my God. Hey. Huh? Turn, turn the amp up? Yeah. Yeah. You're a god, Mike. You know? Fuck you. You may be a loser, but you're still a god. This is a new poem. Well, kind of a new poem. Driving back from the airport through veils of greenery and gold in the haze of summer's eve, spilling down around the curves and shifting up into fifth on the straights, driving fast and slotted from lane to lane, blown above Brooklyn's factory of the dead, a rolling sea of gravestones in the particled light of summer's eve. Another thought for my heart to think, another of beauty's bewildering forms, another secret future to treasure like ice in the bank of melting possibilities. Another perfume, another debt. To the left, the checkered tanks of oil. To the right, above the distance, the flat gray-blue <coughs> cutout of Manhattan's skyline in the sunlit haze. The banked blossoms go by quick, dying with the blossoms again. The past flying out behind like a diaphanous rag, the future in coet inside him, the present a mere observation. Flashed with spring. It's another one uh, from the novel. It's a warm night in early May. There's a breeze of sweet possibilities blowing around the south side. A street light shines through young leaves. I go next door. Ed is sitting on the steps of the porch with a $5 radio trying to pick up a White Sox game he's got 50 bucks on. He's down six to four in the seventh, and now the radio gives only static. Trees are nodding and rustling. There's an occasional yelp from a dog down the street. It's the kind of a night lovers look back on. Ed, red with sweat, wiping his forehead, is turning the radio every which way. He stands up, maneuvering the aerial toward each of the four winds. He climbs up on the porch rail for better altitude. <laughs> he sits back down, pointing the aerial up, down, around, with no luck, he points it toward me. Here, stick this in your mouth a minute. <laughs> the phone rings inside. He says, God damn it, these assholes been calling me all night trying to get a game going. Probably Ronnie or TJ. I told them I'm broke, don't call me, but they won't quit. I can't talk to them again. He let it ring a few times more. Then he says, come on, come on inside, pick up the other phone. I followed him into the house and picked up the extra phone and kept quiet. Ed, master of a thousand voices, answered in the voice of a woman who sees to it she's never alone for long. Hello, he breathed. Uh, hi, is Ed, uh, Eddie there? No, he's not, sugar. Who's this? <laughs> uh, this is Ronnie, buddy of Eddie's. Hello, Ronnie, this is Crystal. 
Ed's mentioned you. Ed mentioned me? No kidding. Uh, what do you say? Well, he says you're a very tough card player. Oh, well, now that you... Well, I guess I am practically a professional. Uh, pretty cool under pressure. Uh, and well-dressed. Hey, did Eddie say that? Well, I own a few suits, and I like to wear a few rings, gold rings, when I go. And nice looking. Uh, I am taller than the average man. And, uh, <laughs> say, uh, Crystal, how long have you known Eddie? Oh, not so long. No, I don't, uh, I don't recall him saying, uh, well, Crystal, we'll have to get together for a drink sometime, uh, you and me, uh, and Eddie. <laughs> sure, hon, I'll tell him you called. Ed hung up and came into the room. Did you hear that? My own buddy tried to stab me in the back. <laughs> These guys are so stupid, Mike. They would never in a million years believe that was me. I wanted so bad to say, this is me, Ronnie, you stupid fuck. <laughs> oh, Jesus, did you hear him? I never crack under the strain. This guy, Mike... He sits there all night with his red face, hands shake so bad he can barely hold his drink. I remembered Ronnie with his gray funeral suit in the back room of the Finn Cafe. I am taller than the average man. <laughs> Trying to make himself out to be some kind of fucking Cary Grant. He's so he's big and clumsy, he's like a big gangly clown. We were still laughing when the phone rang again. It says, shh, shh, quiet, pick it up. <laughs> well, you know what? Your hands are gonna shake Shut anyways. Up. He answered this time. Shut up, Robert. <laughs> he answered this time in the voice of a girl in a trance. Yeah. <laughs> Hello, is Eddie there? No. Who's this? Hello. This is Darla. <laughs> Darla, hi, Darla. This is TJ. Eddie's not home? No. Nope. Uh, what are you doing? I'm not doing anything. No? Well, you want to go for a ride on my motorcycle? <laughs> Darla, I got a motorcycle. We could... don't like motorcycles. I had a crash. Oh, well, uh, Ed's at Roy's. Are you Roy? No, I'm TJ. TJ, it's mentioned you before. <laughs> oh, yeah, what'd he say? He said you're a sick gambler. <laughs> sick? I'm not sick. He's the one that's sick. At least I got food in the refrigerator. What's he got in the refrigerator? Two beers. <laughs> yeah, well, who's sick? Him or me? I got steaks in my refrigerator. You want to come over and have a steak, darling? <laughs> I'm a vegetarian. <laughs> vegetarian? Come on, you must like steak. You want to come over? Oh, bye. <laughs> this is called Faint. Here we are, only hours before dawn, each pursuing separate visions and awake. It's cold and radiators hiss and stop. Who will come to comfort us? The night deals round and round the table, none of us free to go, all of us in debt. Our villain has vanished, and now it's up to us. Thoughts to the rafters, love removes her makeup in the dressing room. The hugeness of the hall, the dark of the arena, strings ring and linger and strumming looms, the voice thin and spectral, papery, yearns toward sympathy but cannot find it. The harmonica swells and then faints to a dance of sweetest, jacket. delicate cruelty, scrapings. This is uh, one of three prose poems. This is number three. One of four prose poems. This is number three. <clears throat> This way, follow me, down six stone steps, three and three, to a place where shadows surrender to an alley, to an alley that we've created, cobbled in a dim light. No one is waiting. We have appeared in a place where it is ours to wait and witness the results of our desires. Take my hand. But our hands must slip apart.
fingers trailing. We glance back at one another and can only hope the coming spin will land us side by side. The walls crash down. Brick dust rises and settles to reveal you gone. I am near an airport on my back, gazing up through a fence to a pure blue sky where jet trails fade. I hear a rustling to my left and turn to experience a panther crouched beside me. She gives me a significant glance and our tongues meet. My eyes close and I am reaching, reaching toward expression. Another rustle and I open my eyes. In the flattened weeds beside me, I find a fresh red chili pepper. I swallow it whole, my guts implode, the blue sky swoops down and then soars away, leaves me walking down a busy street in a place dreamed of by Spaniards, surrounded by hills. I am carrying a candle against the day, the drippings of which have encased my right hand in white wax. As day deepens, I follow the candle toward the black hills, encrusted now with amber lights. Soon the candle is spent and the lights are blinking out and I follow a flaming hand which leads me down darkening ways. I am in a cave in a flickering light, my shadow thrown against the outlines of bulls and antelope, projections of the hunt. I fall to my knees around the flame which streaks in the direction of a way. Before my eyes I see a spinning golden wheel. The wheel cracks in two, the pieces disappear, and I decide to make a choice. I glance once at my shadow on the wall and with ritual grace, blow out the light. There's another short thing from the novel. It's Kitchen, 9 a.m. It says, I went to the track the other day. Listen to this. Now, wait a minute, I tell him. You got anything to drink? I got a half a pint of vodka on the shelf. Have a slug of that. No, I don't mean it. It's 9 o'clock in the morning. You got any juice? <laughs> no juice. I got ice water in the fridge. I pour myself some into an orange plastic cup, swallow a gulp, and wince. What is this? Spring water. Tastes funny. <laughs> How come it tastes so funny? That's because you're used to drinking that shit water from the faucet. That's why. This don't taste right. That's artesian spring water bought from finest. <laughs> this must be a spring on the south side <laughs> you're just not used to where'd you get that cup in the dish rack here oh you know what I, I used that cup I had pine salt in that cup I was trying to get it sick. I must not have rinsed it out all the way damn it what's the matter with you I sit down with the pine salt glowing in my throat now I need a fucking drink chase that with I get up and take a swig from the bottle and sit back down, annoyed with him. I light a cigarette. <laughs> now, what were you going to tell me? Oh, he says, new character at the track. Get this. I'm walking across the street to the track. Here's this guy, old guy, about five foot tall, hunched over, you know, wearing a baseball cap. And there's three guys walking in front of us, right? I'm walking with the old guy. He goes, Mac! These guys keep walking. He goes, Mac! And these guys ain't turning around, you know. Mac! <laughs> Finally, these guys go into the track. They disappear. So I'm behind him at the turnstile. He's paying his way in. He goes, Mac! To the guy in the booth, you know. Goes to the men's room. I follow him in there. Mac! <laughs> Every 15 seconds, he goes, Mac! Just like a fucking parrot. He looked like a parrot. Little hook nose. So I'm talking to one of the cashiers. He says, this guy's been coming out there for 30 years. I go, well, I've been coming out here for 20 years. I've never seen the guy. He goes, I've been here since 1962. He's been doing it. <laughs> so I follow him around again, right? He's got suspenders, big suit pants. He's going, Mac! Five guys turn around. He goes, they talking to me? Said, so I sit on a bench with him. He's got this cap. It says, so many women, so little time. <laughs> And I'm timing him, like, one minute. Mac! <laughs> oh, what the fuck is this? Then I tried to make conversation with him. I moved over. Who's going to win this race, you know? He goes, how the fuck do I know who's going to win this race? Then he goes back to the form, you know? Mac! <laughs> Every 15 seconds, all day long. So get this. I seen the guy for the first time in 20 years of going to the racetrack, right? 
Son of a bitch, if I ain't at fucking Detroit Avenue yesterday, right? Driving up Detroit, I'm stopped at a light. Who's coming across the street with a form in his hand but this guy, right? I go out the window, I go, Mac! Mac! He goes back. He didn't look around, just automatic. Mac! I had to pull over, I was laughing so hard. <laughs> one more short thing here um, this is a collaboration with Richard Catfoot and Creeping what is it? who's there? the rooftop spread with broken glass did you catch up with her? she was right all along wasn't she? fill this 55 gallon drum with tar spring is breathless and full of breath beyond our ruined balcony the sky is stratified and widening over everything else the dribbled moon hangs. I don't want to know. White and redundant metaphors grabbing at me like so many hands out of the walls in a Polanski movie. Like this, self-referring. Let me be. Set me free. Release me. To be caught in the moonlight. Because the blue of moonlight is just the beginning. Like the pink in a white wall is just the beginning. Right? I met her in a junkyard. She pulled me into the back of a big old Dodge and then the war began. <laughs> One tall, skinny tree and the moon out the back window. The sky washed like itself onto clouds like the ghosts of sands. So what? I just absorbed her, rewrote it, and now she's walking around somewhere I can never touch. And I am howling at the moon, which is just another word for her, which is just another word for my fucking blood, which wants to fall from the sky for forty days and forty nights while some grateful, humble dimwit navigates it. Lone survivor, a fool, whose destiny will be the stuff of legend in the interminable future. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, we're going to take like a 15 minute break, and then um, Richard will be up. And in the march, I was driving and driving that cab, Wooster's face and shrouds of morning smoke in the railroad bridge at night. The winds brought snow and turned it to rain. The sky tried sunny, went back to gray. The sky got soaked and froze again and came back sunny blue, and the world bared its muddy ass. I couldn't think of anything to do when I wasn't driving, so I drove the cab night after night and stayed out later and later and had plenty of cash and paid off some old debts and put some cash aside without knowing exactly why and kept driving the cab, prowling around loose and arbitrary, answering calls on the scent of a name. They'd say, Candy at the Diamond Lounge. And I'd be fumbling for the microphone, yelling, I'll take that, 875 for candy. And I'd get there, candy be 60 years old in go-go boots. <laughs> Dead drunk and pissed off, it was time to go home. Or it'd be Lorraine 2 for Lulu. And I'd stammer, I'll take it, 945 for Lulu. And Lulu would be 80 years old, standing in front of the pick and pay with 10 bags of groceries. And I'd take her two blocks, carry ten bags up five flights of stairs, and then carry Lulu up two. And she'd piss on my arm and give me a dime tip. Nights were dark and dirty, or clear by turns. And I began keeping track of the girls on Lorraine, and stopped once at an after-hours place at 69th and Carnegie, where they frisked me at the door. And I traded glances with a woman at the bar and got some looks from a couple guys who didn't remember having seen me before. And I dropped all the money I'd made that night on dice, then got in my car and drove home, thinking I still hadn't found what I was looking for, or even what it was I was looking for. The next morning, Marie called and said she was broke and needed 50 bucks. I met her downtown at a place filled with college boys and bought her a corned beef and gave her the money and felt like I should excuse myself for being there. Ed was winning one night and losing the next three and saying he was still up on fief. And the weather was somewhere between warm and cool, and it rained for days on end, and then for days it didn't rain, but the sky hung heavy with the promise of it, and I thought I could hear church bells ringing across Lincoln Park, though none were ringing. 
<clears throat> and the neighborhood looked uncomfortable, all thawed out and exposed and waiting for spring. St. Patrick's Day was gray and cold, but they roped off part of downtown for the parade. And I was in the cab outside the boundaries before the parade started and picked up three big old ladies going up to 65th in Detroit to play bingo in a church hall. And as I pulled away with them, I said, you just missed all that parade traffic. And the one in the middle set up a low moaning full of sorrowful wisdom like the lowing of a cow, saying, oh, and it's a good thing, too. I never did like no parade. All them people in one place, they could come along and drop a bomb and get everyone at once. That's how they do it. No, I ain't going nowhere near no damn parade. <laughs> Back at the garage, they kept putting cardboard down on the floor to soak up the muddy water and <clears throat> that we tracked in, but the cardboard just got soaked and churned up with the footsteps of a hundred drivers coming in and out and standing around talking and smoking, waiting for cabs. The track opened, and me and Ed went out for opening day and broke even. Then we went out for day two and lost. And the next day, I drove the cab, and Cletus, the night man, started giving me tips. And one night he asked if I was going out to the track tomorrow. <clears throat> I told him I was, though I hadn't known it till that moment. He gave me a sawbuck and told me to bet a $5 reverse on Get Up Richard with Rainmaker in the fourth. Thief didn't take exactas, so I went out there and placed the bet and threw 10 on it for myself. Rainmaker got in there for second, but Get Up Richard missed the board. And for some reason I felt sorry for Cletus. This was a period in which I seemed to be prey to any random stray emotion drifting through. <laughs> he was a hard-looking guy in his early 60s. Maybe he reminded me of my old man. And I'd see him every night in the middle of nowhere behind that glass. It was only a few months later he died of cancer. I thought he was a mean son of a bitch at first. He didn't do much but grunt and shake his head, smiling to an invisible partner like he was permanently pissed off about a trifecta he just missed ten years ago. And then one night my cab broke down and I had to get towed back in and he said just a couple words to me when I walked into the office. Nothing special, but coming from a guy to whom every word was an expenditure, I realized he'd noticed me. Maybe because I was younger than most of the guys driving. And after that, for some reason, I wanted to talk to the guy. Just a few words and for him to like me. And I found myself trying to think of something to say to him as I parked under the railroad bridge every night and walked back toward the office. And so when he gave me the money for this bet, I was proud somehow of the responsibility, and I included in that responsibility that he should win. I was looking forward to walking in there and handing him his winnings and thanking him, because I bet the suckers too. When I walked in to tell him what had happened, he'd already seen the result in the paper. And I told him I'd thrown a sawbuck on them myself to let him know I was on his side, and to assure him that I'd actually placed the bet and hadn't booked it myself. It was no big thing. He was disgusted, as usual, with that resigned, foregone disgust of old gamblers that said he'd either suspected the outcome all along or that we'd somehow been cheated. But either way, it's part of the game. And it was no big thing to me either. I kept walking in there every morning and pulling back at night under the railroad bridge, which loomed as black and ancient as night itself. And even though Cletus and some of the guys I looked up to were way past putting any money down on spring, I couldn't wait to see her come charging in across the wire. One night I decided to pick up one of the girls on Lorraine and spent an hour and a half cruising back and forth and around and around the block with my radio off until I finally pulled over for a tough-looking chick with dark hair shuffling from one foot to the other out front of Steve's lunch. She thought it was funny being picked up in a cab. I flicked her cigarette out the window as soon as we parked. I gave her 15. But although the search and chase had been exciting in a nervous, tunnel vision kind of way, the head was somehow beside the point and extra and amounted to almost nothing and I managed to get it over with more by force of will than any kind of physical stimulation. Afterwards, she asked me my name, and I told her, and she said hers was Kim. And she asked me what I was doing out here paying for sex, so I asked her what she was doing out here selling it, and she said she had a Demerol, or Delauded habit, that amounted to whatever she made in a night, and her boyfriend just got sent to Mansfield, so she had more of an answer than I did. I dropped her off and drove to the garage and pulled the cab up to the fence under the bridge and walked the long walk to the office under that part of the night that is eternal and continuous. I filled out my waybill and gave Cletus a buck, drove home and washed off my crotch and went to bed, thinking, probably, about Ed coming home with a big, sticky, wet spot on the crotch of his pants from disinfecting himself with scope. <laughs> The next morning, 
The next morning I went out to the gym and took my time under the shower, then drove to my folks' place. I spent the afternoon shooting the breeze with my old man and ate dinner with them when my mother got home. Went over and picked up Dave, and we drove around, careless of hours. Ended up parked with him in front of a donut place at four in the morning, drinking coffee and listening to the rain hit the roof, watching it roll down the windshield. Aye. Aye. Robert, you still got that rooster in here? <laughs> Bring that thing up here where we can keep an eye on it. <laughs> He's passed out. Me and Ed are driving around. He says, I was going to stop over Angie's place. You feel like stopping up there for a few minutes? Uh, who's Angie? That girl you picked up the other day? Yeah, she lives right here on 47th. I want you to meet her. Why? I don't know. So you see, I get a halfway normal broad once in a while. She's cute. You'll like her. Would you see her again or something? Yeah, she called me. She actually found that matchbook I gave her with my number. She said she wanted to make a few bucks. I went over there and gave her 15 for some head. Well, what am I going to stand around there while you get a blowjob? Well, she'll give you one too. I got an extra. <laughs> Forget it, Ed. He turns a corner onto 47th, a street like a mouthful of broken teeth. This is a bad fucking street, he says. Ed, what are you doing? We're going to see Angie, he says. For what? I don't know. She, I kind of like her. She seems goofy, but she's actually, you know, kind of constructive chick. <laughs> We're walking across a vacant lot to go around back of her house. What do you mean, constructive? <laughs> she seems like she's trying to pull herself together. She's got a guitar up there. Says she practices every day. She's got a little barbell she does her exercises with. She's got books. Says she's studying. I just want you to see her. You'll be proud of me. The backyard is dark and muddy. The moon's hidden behind a high, thin beach of cloud. A dog starts barking in the next yard. Bottom door is open. We step into a blackness that pulls itself in after us, and I follow his cigarette ember up a stairway. Fucking neighborhood. You never know if somebody's going to be waiting for you with a ball bat. At the top of the stairs, he starts rapping on a door, hard. We wait. No sound. She's kind of hard of hearing. Got cotton stuffed in her ears. <clears throat> he bangs on the door. I'm going, Ed, maybe she ain't. Angie! Angie, it's Ed! Still not a sound from inside. The darkness at the top of that stairway seems to thicken. I get a signal of fear. Angie! He gives the door a kick, and my <laughs> fear wriggles free and runs ahead of me. It turns to anger. Ed, what the hell are you doing? Maybe she ain't here. Ah, uh, she just don't hear too good. Boom, boom, boom. He's pounding the fucker like he's going to break it down. Angie, it's Ed! Angie! Still not a sound of life. Ed, I'm getting out of here. Even if she is there... She don't want to answer, and they can probably hear this across the street. I start down the stairs. He's waiting. Son of a bitch. He starts down after me, and from the top of the blackness comes a muffled sound. The door opens, and a slant of light falls across the landing. Angie, it's me, Ed. We turn back up the stairs, and there's, uh, there's Angie, <clears throat> holding the door maybe six inches open and staring straight out, like she's going to find someone there at eye level which in her case is about four foot nine. I realize that if we've come to the right place, it's definitely the wrong place. Angie. She looks up as though it's a coincidence that she opened the door and someone was standing there. <laughs> Can we come in? She steps back and we step into the bare light of her kitchen. She stands riveted and fearless, staring up at Ed without surprise, as though at the fulfillment of a prophecy as though she knows him from a former life to be no more than an equal. We meet at last. <laughs> she's a little chick with a round head and perfect cheekbones, full mouth, short blonde hair, but she's got these big pink shades that look like the eye sockets of a skull. I'm trying to recall who it was told me any girl under five foot tall and under a hundred pounds will turn out to be crazy. The height factor is ominously plain to see, so I'm trying to gauge her weight. <laughs> Ed says, this is my friend, Mike. I nod, but she's still staring at Ed. He starts to say something else, but by then the first signal reaches her, and she turns and shouts, hi. 
<laughs> and it goes back to Ed. Maybe it's the nakedness of the light in there, or maybe it's my presence. <clears throat> but now Ed's even a little uncomfortable. He says something about how we're going to go pick up something to eat. And does she want us to... What? She shouts. <laughs> we're going to go get a coffee and a sandwich. You want us to bring you something back? What? You want something to eat? No. You want some... I'm making dinner now. I glance around for any signs of dinner being underway. Nothing on the stove. There's no sign of the place having been organized, even unconsciously, into any kind of living pattern. Looks like she moved in yesterday. You're... I'm cooking spaghetti. I had the feeling Angie's reciting the wrong script. And then I notice... On the floor, in the dust, beside the fridge, an electric frying pan plugged into the wall with an inch and a half of dusty water in it. <laughs> Ten or twelve strands of pasta lying stiff and stuck together in the bottom. No steam or any hint of the cooking process, nor any clue as to how long Angie's been waiting for dinner to be ready. <laughs> a sigh escapes me. I tell Ed, well, let's go get something to eat and come back. Yeah. Uh, you sure you don't want a sandwich or something? Well, all right, we'll be back in a... Oh, could you get some beer? She says this as though asking us to steal sacred scarabs from the pyramids. <laughs> yeah, well, no problem. What kind of beer do you want? She's moving backwards, as though with the force of thought. She backs to the sink, reaching into memory. There was one kind of beer. It's going Miller, Michelob, Strohs, Molson. Milwaukee, she whispers. Milwaukee's best? No, no. Old Milwaukee? That's it! I'm shaking my head. It's going, okay, we'll bring you some old Milwaukee. Listen for us at the door. We leave her rigid against the sink, staring at the doorway. Waiting in the drive through line, a brown bag of old Milwaukee between us. What do you think, he says. <laughs> kind of cute. Kind of short, too. Better find out what she weighs. <laughs> What she weighs? Forget it. I'll tell you one thing, though. It would be a good idea to find out how old she is. She told me she's 22. Yeah, she told you she was cooking spaghetti for dinner, too. <laughs> yeah, I, I ain't trying to fuck her over or nothing. I just like her. She's, you know, a tough little kid. In the blackness, in the blackness of the stairway, Ed's pounding. Angie! Angie, it's us! Son of a bitch, if she take that fucking cotton out of her ears, maybe she can hear something. Angie, open up! It's Ed! He tries the door, it's unlocked, it opens, and there's Angie, still at the sink, exactly as we left her. Jesus Christ, didn't you hear us out there? Angie, what are you doing? What? Here, we got you the beer and a cheeseburger and fries in case you get hungry later. I'm cooking spaghetti. Something snarls inside me. Ed opens the fridge and the light doesn't go on. Sticks his hand inside. It's warm in here, does this fucking thing work or what? No response. I ask him if it's plugged in. The man is coming here to turn the refrigerator on. He plugs it in. The refrigerator ticks and hums into process. It's all right. It's working now, he says. Standing around in the kitchen, nothing's being said. I crack a beer, light a cigarette. Ed says, so what were you... Uh, I was studying. I have to keep studying. She heads for the other room, leaves us there. I look at Ed, raise my eyebrows. He follows her and I follow him. Angie's on a mattress on the floor in a nest of clothes and books and papers. A patchwork of clashing colors and objects in a maelstrom of purpose. There's a little TV turned on without sound and Angie's going through a book, turning pages and taking notes and staring at the TV. Ed sits behind her on the mattress. So, uh, I don't know, you need anything here? No response. I'm in the doorway. There's a barbell in the corner, tangled in rags, weights on one end, the other end resting on the floor. My car, she says. Can you take me to look for my car? What car? They stole my car. I had a car. Can you help me find it? Yeah, okay. okay. Good, I saw them driving it today. <clears throat> Angie, did you have a license for the car, I say? Do you got a driver's license? I have a driver's license. Well, yeah, let's see it. I'd like to see the picture. She's taking notes from her book and staring at the TV, and then she dives into a pile of clown rags. I had it here somewhere. I spot a driver's license on top of an unplugged clock. 22 years old. Ed says, Angie, play the guitar for Mike. He likes music. Why don't you, why don't you play him a song? I spot an electric guitar on the floor. It's got two strings, both hanging loose, 
unwound. The guitar is covered with dust. Uh, that's all right. Maybe some of the, I don't have time now. I have to keep studying. It says, what are you studying anyway? He picks up the book she's taking notes from. Oh, jeez. He shows it to me. The Fundamentals of Arc Welding. <laughs> Let's go ahead. <laughs> he replaces the book beside her notebook. All right, we're uh, going to take off here. Angie? Yes? We're going to go. You need anything? You got any money? No, she says, without a hint of asking for any. He puts a 10 on top of the TV. I'm on my way to the door. Bye, she yells as he closes the door behind us. Aye, 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 aye. Um, yeah, actually, somebody told me they spotted her about six months ago on 55th and Broadway. Um, there's a racetrack story, it's Ed talking about, uh, about the track. Uh, he says, I went out there, this is like five years ago, I would never do this now, and I had a pocket full of them, not cherry bombs, but M80s, yeah. Oh, man. I used to sit on the steps leading to the grandstand. You know, there's that series of stairways all in a line. But some of them were closed at the top with, like, garage doors, right? So you could sit up there and nobody fuck with you. So I was sitting up there reading a form, and I had these M80s in my pocket. So I tore the filter off my cigarette and stuck the wick of one of these firecrackers into the unlit end, right? And walked down the steps, you know, with my form and my hat and my pipe and my glasses and slippers and just sat on the bench like an old man reading the form. <laughs> About ten minutes later, boom! Fucking people scattered. Man, what the fuck? You know, these things were equivalent to a jumbo firecracker, but inside a monumental fucking concrete thing, man, it sounds like a fucking grenade, you know? And everybody's kind of looking, you know, no big deal. I said, that, that's fucking great, man. So there was like six of these stairways. I go to the next one, go way up to the top there, read the form, look around like fucking John Dillinger, put another wick on there, light it, walk down, I'm just relaxing, boom! People, what the fuck, another one? Some of the old timers are getting pissed off, you know, people get mad, disturbed, you know, when you get scared, you get mad, that's a fact, I know that myself. I thought, man, this is great, nobody in the world... No, I did that, and I, I could see how people get away with crime, you know? So I went to the next one, right? Totally in the clear, people kind of milling around. Put another one on there, go down, same thing, boom, everybody runs over there. Now the security guards started coming out. What the fuck's going on here? They got radios, Knox is there, the head of security, sport jacket. I walk over, folding my form under my arm. Oh, what's wrong, officer? Uh, some kids are throwing firecrackers from up there, we'll get them. Oh, yeah, that's... It's dangerous. They're, where, from the cracks up there? Yeah, we think they're dropping them. So while they're investigating that, I backtrack, put another one up there. Boom! They go running up there. Six of these fuckers I lit off, right? The whole security force was out there. Then I got scared. I go, man, this is, this is big time. This is like inciting a riot or causing mayhem. You know, they got a crime. It's called mayhem or something. The whole track was shook up. Even the jockeys were wondering what's going on. You know, somebody's shooting us? I got one left. Here's Max the mailman, who lost three homes, his wife, his business, everything he's ever owned. He's totally in another world. 9,000 keys on his ring and 9,000 pens in his pocket, just walks around in a daze. Max the mailman. Lost his mailman job for 30 years. He had a side business, total racetrack degenerate. They got this big rubber plant with all these wood chips. I got one left, so I go bury it in these wood chips, put the cigarette there. I walk away, I'm waiting, I'm waiting. Here comes Max, reading his form. Stands right next to the fucking thing. I started laughing. I go, holy fuck. It goes, boom! Fucking chips flew up. What the fuck? He jumped so far. He's looking around. He was so pissed. Wood chips flew all over the place. The grand finale. Nobody could figure it out. The security guards are dildos, as you know. But even so, why I did that? But I walked out of there going, here, I just fucked up this whole racetrack. <laughs> If you were there, you'd have to think, what, there's some fucking rioters or, you know, someone losing their head shooting? And I did it 
so nonchalantly and discreetly walked back and sat down on the bench and then five minutes later, boom, walked to the next one, boom, you know, boom. I did it with no regard for my safety or nothing. <laughs> I went back the next day, and honest to God, the next day and the next day after that, they had extra security people out patrolling around. Like, for a week, they were shook up out there. It cost them a lot of man hours. Did you get arrested? <laughs> what did you say? <laughs> well, this is called Trains. This is an outtake from Through the Windshield. I was on the tracks alone in that brief blue time of low phosphorescence, moments after sunset, thinking about how train tracks have a special presence from sunset on till just after dawn, and oh, you know, how we used to catch crayfish in that mud hole over there, and snakes, and that winter Alex bought a tarantula and kept it in an empty aquarium with a window screen over the top, weighted down with a dictionary and L through Z of the encyclopedia. And the thing was worthless, didn't budge all winter long. And we would read in this old tarantula book how they could jump six feet across a room and how painful their bite was. So we were cautious of the thing, and Al's mother stopped going into his room to straighten up, and the room piled up with dishes and dirty laundry. <clears throat> and we'd take four buses across town through the dark, hostile heart of the east side, a couple of scared white kids trying to sit up near the bus driver, going to a dusty, forgotten pet shop sold crickets in midwinter. We'd get crickets for the tarantula in a little white bag you could see their shadows against, clinging and trying to get out. And the whole way back home, we'd still be the only two white faces. But we could sit in the back, because who's going to fuck with someone's carrying crickets in a bag in the middle of January? <laughs> I mean, you got to figure anyone transporting crickets over neighborhood lines got to be a hoodoo voodoo motherfucker <laughs> with a different set of motives and means business. <laughs> We'd get back to Al's room, and I'd be a few feet back with a baseball bat in case that tarantula came flying out as they're known to do, without warning, six feet through the air with fangs bared. <laughs> and Alex would sneak up and move the books with a cricket in one hand and lift the corner of the screen, drop the cricket in there, and the spider wouldn't make a move. Next morning, the cricket be gone. This went on for months until Al Alex figured the tarantula was keeping still just to spite him. And finally one day he just got fed up with it and threw the books and screen aside and reached in there with a work glove and grabbed the thing and flushed it down the toilet. <laughs> anyway, it got dark. And then suddenly the moon was there and I turned around for the walk back along the ties, the tracks a shine escaping in bluey white ahead. I remembered Curtis Smith, a kid I never knew or even spoke to from school who never said a word to anyone, and who none of us ever knew anything about. Just one of those silent, mysterious bit players around school in the neighborhood, but from the other side of Babbitt Road, so we didn't see him much. A tall, rangy, lanky kid, skinny as a rail, older than us, with an older face, like a face made older by work, or silence, rather than by experience or wisdom. And something dark about his face like a face that would be naively attracted to the dark side of a county fair that comes to a small town. Attracted at first furtively and then magnetized, oblivious and trapped. Kurt used to ride his bicycle back and forth to school, an old-fashioned bike with the straight handlebars and flat seat from an Indiana cornfield, streamers flying, strangely upright. He looked like he'd ridden that bike straight out of the Depression every morning and straight back into it in the, after school in the afternoon. But the thing I remember most about him was the thing that made him into a minor legend and gave everyone <clears throat> something to sink their teeth into if they wanted something to say about him. He used to wear this old engineer's cap all the time, the kind of striped cap an engineer ain't worn in 40 years. And every day after school, he'd ride home and get a notebook and then pedal straight back to the tracks and wait for the trains. When a train had come, he'd write the time and the line and the car count in his notebook, and then he'd wait for the next train, one leg on the ground, below the sky. Sometimes, when his father got home early from wherever he worked during the day, he'd join his son and they'd count the cars together, comparing results and entering them into the notebook, the one notebook shared by father and son. The idea of such a notebook surrendered from father to son but shared in the hour or two before dinner. Curtis Smith did this day in and day out over a period of time which may as well have been eternity, and was eternity in the way 
that memories exist in a sort of continuum like eternity. Until he was old enough to get a job at pick and pay, rounding up shopping carts from the parking lot and then from all over the neighborhood, pushing them in long, slow trains back to the store. So this cut into his train watching time, but he was still counting cars. A clicking was fed along the tracks, the black of familiar shadows to either side, reeds and backyards, a certain dog barking, and that same moon. I looked around and saw the light coming. All the air trembled and I jumped aside. All the night was filled with the noise of it. The sound was intolerable, roaring by. I stood witness from the shadows, a mixture of terror and awe, and then stepped back onto the track in the, wakes, <clears throat> in the wake of its clinkage, clink, and watched the blackness of it gathering itself into the future, the red of its caboose lights disappear. I made it back from the Yellow Freight Company at 8.30 in the morning. I climbed into bed with the sun in my eyes and the birds yapping and managed to sleep till almost noon. I spent the day as usual in a kind of bewilderment, always just a step behind waking reality. Evening snapped me out of it and I felt almost human for a couple hours, but by 9.30 I was sinking again. Mr. Jim called. You want to go out to Yellow Freight again? Yeah, sure. Okay, it's yours. The shift began at 11. From 11 to 7.30, there was nothing to do but sweep. The building was one long dock in the shape of a T with semi-trailers backed up to it all the way around. The regulars were teamsters. For sweeping, they used a crew of spot laborers, five or six of us, a night. Our supervisor was an edgy little guy in an army jacket, round glasses, combat boots, heavy-duty work gloves. He was beneath the contempt of the people who ran the place, but he had a desk between some storage crates and a whisk room with his name scratched into it, and he took his position seriously. Six guys with push brooms erasing, erasing each other's tracks all night long. There was nothing to sweep in the first place, only a thin black dust, the carbon residue of truck exhaust along aisles of freight under sodium lights. The night smelled like diesel. We couldn't tell the difference between what we were sweeping and what we'd swept. We'd lose track. I was stuck in one aisle for an hour and a half one night, sweeping back and forth. By two in the morning, we were working in pantomime. Every night deteriorated into an abstract exercise, a challenge. By four, we were fighting over debris. By six, we were tossing things on the floor, scraps of paper, wood chips. <coughs> Union guys on tow motors went rattling by with a whiff of propane, eating donuts, flicking cigarettes at us. There was a huge trash compactor that broke up loose boards and pallets. There was a water cooler at either end of the dock. The bathroom had plenty of powdered hand cleaner. So between piling up skids and standing around listening to the crack and splinter of the trash compactor and stopping for drinks of water and keeping our hands cleaner than a surgeon's, we could skirt the brink of insanity. I'd go from one end of the floor to the other, a good quarter mile, to stop for a drink of water. I'd zigzag down aisles of freight, dodging tow motors on a ten-minute hike to scrub some dust off my hands. And twenty minutes before every break, you could look down the line and see the six of us scattered along, winding down, checking over our work, checking the time, wiping our foreheads, tying our shoelaces. In the break, in the break room, we'd sit well apart. We couldn't stand the sight of one another. We each thought the other five were bums, obviously unfit for any other kind of work. The Teamsters tried to catch ten minutes sleep where they played cards or dug into huge lunches their wives had packed for them. Cans of pop, zingers, ho-hos, candy bars, cookies, an occasional sandwich on white bread, but mostly little treats, cakes and chips, peanut butter and jelly. The six of us sat there drinking coffee, silent, trying not to meet anyone's gaze. One guy, a Teamster, came in every break and sat down, put his feet on a chair, pulled his baseball cap over his eyes and started burping as loud as he could. <laughs> He'd lift his cap to check the crowd reaction. Three of his buddies sat at the table with him and laughed along, nudging one another. I tried to imagine how bored with him his wife must be. One guy'd sit there, deadpan, saying, You're sick, you know that? <clears throat> the guy would let loose in reply. Two would laugh, and the third, playing his part, would say, You're really a sick motherfucker. This would go on for 15 minutes at the first break, then a half hour at lunch, 
then another 15 minutes on the late break, non-stop. The guy was big, like most of them, huge belly, skinny forearms, red face, and like most of them, he looked like he'd be dead of a heart attack in 10 years. A couple of the spot labor guys had tried to join in by laughing conspicuous, conspicuously. I thought it was something he'd come up with for one night, but it turned out that was his main thing, you know, every night. For some reason, they made us take lunch at 5 o'clock. It was a long wait. My second night, I was carrying a headache around, falling asleep in my footsteps, leaning on the broom. I looked down the line at 3 and saw that everything was under control. The sweeping, sweeping was coming along nicely. <laughs> I walked to the end of the dock and downstairs to the break room. One of our six was there, grabbing himself a coffee. A beaten hound dog, lean and hunched over, crooked jaw, mop of curly hair. I walked past him, out the door, crossed the parking lot to my car. I crawled inside and went to sleep. I woke and it was still dark out. I dug a pair of work gloves out of the back, walked across the lot and jumped up onto the dock. The clock said 4.45. As soon as I stepped onto the floor, the hound dog came sweeping by. Go see John. John wants to see you right away. He's in his office. John was the supervisor. I stepped into his office. He leaned back in his swivel chair, put his boots on the desk. I figured they'd pay him four bucks an hour, four fifty tops. He twirled his key ring on one finger. Where in the hell have you been? What do you mean, where have I been? I've been sweeping, I said, annoyed. He took his boots off the desk and leaned forward, containing himself. Give a guy a ring of keys in his own whisk room, he thinks he's Napoleon. <laughs> you were seen leaving the building at 3.30. It is now 4.47. Where have you been for the last hour and 17 minutes? I went out to my car to get these work gloves. I showed him. I was gone five minutes. I've been sweeping ever since. I look for you at 4 o'clock. That's probably at the trash compactor over on City Dock. I don't know. What do you call me in for here for anyway? I got sweeping to do. <laughs> he eyed me over. Don't leave the dock without my permission. Take your lunch at five with everyone else. That's all. The fucker. Right then I decided not to come back that night at 11. And I didn't. I bet a baseball game instead. Here's the last three pages of the novel. My dear God. Come on with that shit, Robert. A little after this was over, I was at the table after midnight. I rinsed the coffee cup, slipped on a jacket, locked up, and went downstairs. Dave had moved in behind Mr. Jim. I knocked on his door. The night was rolling and blowing. He came to the door without a shirt. Hey, come on in. I stepped inside. What's up? Nothing. I'm going for a ride. Yeah, sounds good. Let me get dressed. He didn't ask where. It never mattered. I pulled out and around the corner. Damn, I forgot to get cigarettes. I figured you'd have one, he said. I searched my jacket pockets and came up empty. Look around, I said. He checked the glove compartment, under the seats, above the visor. The streets of the neighborhood were deserted. Check in back. Look in that taxi jacket back there. He leaned over and rummaged around. Yeah, he came up with an old squashed pack. Might be one left. I glanced over, cruising up literary. He tore open the pack. Nope, two left. Excellent. He handed me one. I dug a book of matches out of the seat and gave it to him. He struck a light, protecting with cupped hand the tiny flame that kindled his face, and I leaned over, rolling past Lincoln Park, and he lit mine with the same match. We were all set. The taillights of an old caddy brighten to slow and then dip, diminishing into a turn, surrounded by the black of night gives you that sinking feeling. I kept driving, and the night sky went from glowing to glowering. Winter blew in, wrapped itself like a bedsheet around the rear window of an old Pontiac. I left town. And I'm going to read a couple of prose poems, a few. <laughs> Recipe. Drink the wine, drink more, more wine, till you're almost human again. Reach that point of peace and forgiveness which is each day's goal. Forgive yourself and everyone else while you're at it. And keep drinking wine, shoot past that point of peace until you're again the center of a wildly spinning universe, hub of the celestial ghost wheel. Note the flight of dragons and signets and bears, the fleshing and fading of constellations, 
from periphery to periphery, the sped lives of dreams resurrected from the far black reaches of time. Drink one more glass and maybe catch a glimpse of who you should have been. Tell yourself it's who you are and freeze it against morning. Big star. So available downs and cold Sundays, an avalanche of yourself, suddenly alone and sweeping up, bottomed out and wide aware, weekend true. Radiators hiss and bang. I'm betrayed by minor hatreds and blown way off the trail. I radiate the lake's cold, hunched in a jacket, distracted from my original purpose, which was love. I type away like rust, corroding the core and left with handfuls of gas. Let's get back for an off-kilter dance in the crashing Jesus. Let's spread out. Grant us grace and elevation. We're a holocaust and we want out. Yeah. So driving again with you in my blood. Another town, driving into autumn now. Autumn's dazzle, wearing shades. My hair left over from the other side of the screen. I feel you watching me, flip a cigarette out the window. The sweet, wet smell of autumn rains, its yellow litter all around. I could fade back into legend, it's what people seem to expect of me, but I'm looking for something more personal now. I shine like a saint, reflection of a guiding light, and I will follow that light through the hole we tore in the air, off the edge of land and sailing onto open sea, holding my course so long as bone and skin of ship sustain to a place where I'll whisper, okay, baby, let's go. And we'll fly up, soar away, dissolving, gone, until only stars describe us. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> The day was like a few drips of orange sherbet wiped up in an old rag. <laughs> White sky. I stood at the top of the YMCA stoop, my hair still wet from the shower, empty street, then walked to the car and tossed the bag in back. I was a few drips of hope wrapped in an old calm, descending a curved hill, the river to the left and the projects to the right, the trees still bare, the slope still brown, the lake still frozen from the freeway heading east, keeping at or near the speed limit, unhurried. The past has spit me out like a seed. I check the mirror for facial nicks and find myself intact, get along. I keep my fears in a shirt pocket and light them as I choose, but they are a small part of time which runs like linen, lightly textured through my fingers. Boot scuff, a glint of gold. I'm familiar with myself by now. Shuffle, turn. There are moments when I savor your absence as though it were presence. The beat is a straight 4-4 four four informed with a certain swing. White sky, like I say, soon the buds. Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> this is the last thing. Um, thanks for coming, everybody. I'm just going to read one more thing here. Read something happy. Okay, this is it. <laughs> yeah, where are you? I can't see you. On the floor here, Mike. Read something happy. This is it, Robert. This is the happy one. I love you, Mike. Okay. <laughs> Night was an old fact. A guy and a girl were sitting on a porch. It was late, the breeze had died. Below them, the mill valley smoldered like a cigarette, imperfectly stubbed out and forgotten. Night was just an old fact. They'd been talking, but in that way that people do on a porch, where the silence means as much as what is said. In the scruffy yard was a bush, which still had a few blossoms hanging this way and that, big white flowers open in the night. It felt as though anything they looked at or said was for the last time. The girl was upset and worn out. Two days ago, her lover had cut her off. At one point, the guy said he needed cigarettes, so they got into his car and he drove to a 24-hour gas station. When they got back to the curb in front of his house, they realized they were cold, so they stayed in the car with the lights off and the heat on low. 
They stared at the street, and the car idled. The girl was thinking about the near future, the near future she'd suddenly been handed. She said, I'm worried I'm going to get sick, too. He looked at her and said, you're not going to get sick, you're protected. By what? And then he said something that surprised them both. It was something that just came out of him. By your generosity, he said. She was quiet a moment. I never really thought of that as protection before. Yeah, he said, what other protection is there? What else do we have? Our generosity is the only protection we have. <laughs>